Rolls in the corner. Corner man coach. Corner man is in charge. They either oversee or in, or in direct or are in direct control of every moment from the fighter arriving at the venue until the fighter leaves. So it is the corner man or coach's role to make the event seem as absolute smooth as possible, even if it's a fucking shit, shit show. So there are times that fights are nightmares, the promoters are unorganised, you don't know if your opponent's turning up, someone's sick in another room, you know, like there's this thing going on. It's your job not to let your fighter feel that that's an anxiety for you. So they're going to sense it already, but the more you can make them think like, oh, this just happens all the time, because look, coaches calm as anything, then they're going to naturally think, oh, this is okay, this must be how it always is. But as soon as you get anxious about it, or you start yelling at someone, or you're like, oh man, it's not here, I don't know what's going on, I'm going to go and deal with everything, then they're like in that, what, what's happening? So the calmness is really, really important. You're there to help settle it all. A second, a second or seconds are there to assist the corner man in whatever they need. So, as we turn up, um, we've got into the venue, it's at that point that the seconds generally can drift off for ages because they're probably not really needed. So, uh, it could be that the seconds are needed because they're the fighter's good luck charm. So, you know how like horses, good race horses often have like a, another horse with them to keep them calm? So sometimes someone in your second team might be that person. And they're better sitting with them than, than the coach sitting with them. Yeah, so it depends how long the relationship's been between them, who's going to be the senior coach and then the second. So the second is there to, to support the corner man, but the corner man might say, man, your role's here to keep him calm. And some people will be too calm. It's like, man, your role's to wake him up every 10 minutes. Make sure we're all right. Yeah. Cut man. A cut man is normally the corner man or one of the seconds. However, in high stake fights, a corner may supply a fourth person to work solely on swelling and cuts, freeing up the coach to consider the boxer at the bout in its entirety and not be distracted by cuts. So I've only got, as a cornerman, I've only got maybe one minute to two minutes, depending on the fight rules, to uh, get my um, fight out back into uh, breathing, calm, understanding what's just happened and what we're about to do. Motivate them, reinvigorate them. But if my whole time's there patching up the cut, then I'm probably too much concentrating on that to give them any other commands. And all they're thinking in their head is, I'm cut, I'm, I'm screwed, whatever. So if, as the corner man, uh, I thought, God, he's cut, I'm going to have to work on that, I might say to the second, man, you're going to have to talk to him about what we want next, because I'm going to have to work on that cut. You know, So I would switch my role slightly so I could do it. Or if I had a second that was good at it, had had some experience at it, then I would leave it to them to work it. And they'd just be playing the person's head or face or wherever it is, and I'd just be talking to them like nothing has happened to them. Yeah. And again, it, it's that calmness you've got to exhibit from both people. But it's not like, Jesus, man, it's a massive hole. <laughs> like it's a, it, you know, like even if you think of that, it's a, oh, easy man, we've got this patched up, we'll, we'll get this sorted. You know, and you just stay calm. And, and if at the end of the round, at the end of the break time, you haven't, then the decision's easy. It's like, oh, sorry, mate, can't go on. We couldn't stop it. But you don't need to tell them to start. Give yourself every chance you can to get them back out. As long as it's safe to do so. Um, in some jurisdictions uh, or promotions, such as one or, or UFC, a cut man is supplied and only they are allowed to treat the cuts. So the corner isn't actually allowed to do it. So um, one of the fights that we had in New York, uh, we weren't, if there was a cut, we weren't going to be allowed to treat the cut. The cut man that they supplied. It was very strange in, in America at the two fights that we did over there. Um, no, nearly no corners knew how to wrap hands because most promotions supply a hand wrapper and then the corner pays them like 60 bucks or 30 bucks or something to wrap hands. And I was like, I've always get paid nothing really. I'd be, I'd be better off just going around wrapping all these two hands. But I, where that, we don't, that doesn't tend to happen in Australia where everyone will wrap their own hands. And in fact, it's a, like a, a badge of honour almost, like you can wrap the hands well and if you're looking after your fighter. Um, but it was also that learning period where you often don't know how, so it's good to have someone with you or another coach. So generally, fight communities in Australia are quite good. So Dylan and I were there, and Dylan knew me from working here. Like I said, my gym, he was at a different gym, and he might say, Matt, it's the first time I've had to wrap hands at a pro fight, can you just come sit with me? And I'll just give him tips if I can miss out wrong. I'm just going to say, it's a very good community like that. You know, we tend to help each other. 
exploit. So don't be afraid to ask if you need help. The weigh-in. The coach or a second should attend all weigh-ins. So that means just don't send the fighter on their own. If the fighter is overweight, you will need to negotiate with the promoter. If the weight needs to be cut, you will need to find the best solution for your fighter. So uh, let's say it's a, a low-level fight where 130, you know, maybe um, one and a half kilos out, we're overweight. Then the promoter will generally, and, and the other fight team will say, we want you to try and lose weight. What they want you to do is try and get fatigued, not for the fight. So you would generally sort of go, um, all right, we'll skip the 15 minutes and we'll see what comes off. That's all we can try and do tonight. We'll see how we go. And in a low level fight, probably all they're gonna expect you to do. If it's a high level fight and you're 150, 200 grams, and the weight levels are fairly low, then we would make the person work for over an hour to try and get it off and make sure that they're either in a sauna or a sauna suit, because we want to see them suffer as much as possible. And the reason for that is, your fighter has generally suffered for five or six days to drop that weight. And if that other person maybe has tried as hard as they can, but maybe hasn't, and they're just coming at their weight, and they're ready to put on another kilo and a half on top of that, um, it's, it's unfair to your fighter who's going in there already a little bit fatigued and flat. And it's also a bit of that mental game. You, so like I'm saying, low level fights, you'll let stuff slide. High level fights, it's like you know the game, you know, you know what you're doing. You know, so these guys know three days out what their weight is and the chance of getting on weight. And generally they're going to be 200 grams, 300 grams under, and you know, like in the morning, and that gives them a cup of water they can drink throughout the day to keep hydrated. So you balance it, you know, you know where you are. So I don't mean they're at weight two or three days out, I just mean they know where they are. They know they've got two kilos left to go. Not before you a kilo, kilo and a half, you lose half kilo through sleep. You know, the next day you just do a little run, warm up, and you generally got the last one. Okay, so it's really important that as a corner person you get to, to weigh-ins. If it's an a, uh, amateur fight, weigh-ins usually just before the fight, so it's not uh, that much of a stress. You don't want your fighter stressed about weight. You weigh them two weeks before and say, this is your normal walk around weight, probably what you're going to fight at. Let's just set it at that. Don't, okay, we're going to drop three kilos in the last two weeks, especially if it's their first fight or something. Yeah, wouldn't worry about it. Um, if, then, if the opponent is overweight, you'll need to negotiate again with them. Um, and it could even include counselling about. Like a, so we had a boxing fight for one of our guys, his first ever fight. The other guy was three kilos heavier, but looked like eight kilos, like just a big difference. And it was just, it was, just wasn't going to happen. You know, our guy was just really green, just wanted him to have the experience. The other guy, was not only big, but he looked like he had stuff. So in it, my balance of thought, I thought, no, he's, he's for his last fight, he fights his fight. So you're over, we're not fighting, done, you know? Um, other times, like I said, we negotiate because our guy's been working so hard, you know, I'm not really worried about the weight difference because he fights bigger guys all the time, you know? So you, you judge it on, on your experience. Uh, the coach should handle all the discussions with as little as drama as possible so the fighter does not become stressed or anxious about the bout. A fighter should not drive themselves in case they are dehydrated. So you don't want your fighter driving to the weigh-in because that will probably be cutting weight and they're not dehydrated and they'll be distracted and they could have an accident. Okay, the next bit, uh, there's a note spot. So you can write down what's in our fight kit normally if you want to. So I'm just gonna pull out our fight kit things. We would normally have some pads for warming up. Doesn't matter if they're focus pads, thigh pads, a whole full set. We generally try and keep it simple because we don't do massive warm ups. Lower level fighters will do more warm ups than with higher level fighters. Higher level fighters tend to be able to do more shadow and just get them stretched out. Lower level fighters need to feel the sting of the pad, they need to feel that they've got power in them, they need that sort of hype up of hitting stuff. Um, high level guys tend to not want to fatigue too much, work. they may want to do something. So Reese's come, always wanted to push people walls to stretch himself out to feel that energy on it. Uh, other people like doing big round kicks and step power shots. Some people like to throw big heavy crosses just to feel it. That's how I want to hit, that's where I want to be. So you just work with your fighter. If it's an amateur event, we may, if they don't supply singlets, we would take a red and blue singlet. If they supply singlets, which most of the amateur events at the moment are, um, but then we don't even take it. If it's an amateur event that needs padding, and it's a tie event, because that's what we're talking about, we may need knee pads and elbow pads if the promoters don't supply. Most supply, don't you? Most supply. 
skipping rope. The fighter, we expect them to bring wraps if it's an amateur event, otherwise we'll wrap them ourselves. Groin cut, mouth guard. You see they have to have a license, their license. So for pros you need to have a license, for amateurs um, they have a book. Have these guys done a book then for the last uh, down? Depends, depends on the amateur, some of them don't like just you just register and they have it documented and then other ones like if you like, have to have a book. Uh, and then the pros actually don't have to have a physical license anymore. They don't even get used to that. That's right. No physical license anymore. Which is good because it used to rub off with the lemon oil. Okay, then there's, uh, so this stuff's more for pro stuff, but um, for your interest anyway. This is just a stamp here, I don't but a Mon Com and Brigitte's. Not many people will wear the flowers, but some people like to wear the flowers. Ice bags. If you don't have ice bags, zip lock bags for putting ice in. Now for a tie fight, we would generally do a bottle of water per round, because we'll often pour it on the person a bit as well. If it's just for someone to sip, you will get through about that much in the whole fight. Because a person's not going to get dehydrated in the fight, but what they get is cotton mouth. So we're treating cotton mouth rather than treating dehydration. So that's why you are meant to have a bucket for your fighter to wash their mouth out and spit in. Very rarely do people in tie fights spit because generally we don't have the bucket close. <laughs> it's full of ice and stuff. But it's relevant to so they can either, uh, swallow it, spit on the floor, spit on their legs, spit in the bucket. But generally it's to wash the mouth out rather than drink. So don't try and feed your fighter water because they'll start gagging on it and they'll feel heavy in the guts. It's just that feeling of it. You're better off pouring it on the back of their neck and their head to reinvigorate them. And you can control that as well if fighters like wanting water. Yeah. Uh, they will normally, if they want it, they normally won't drink. drink. They'll normally just sit there. But yeah, I'll, I'll put it just a little. Yeah. I like open bottles way better than sippers and sports things. I never work, I can't look at it open. So I feel like I agree. <laughs> I feel silly. But this I can control. I know exactly how much it is. I can see it. I can pour it when I want. If I've got the city sip bottle, all I can do is hold it in their mouth. It's very hard for me to do anything else with it. If I, and particularly if they've got blood on them, I need to wipe the blood off quickly. So it's easy for me to splash water on them and wipe it off with a towel. But if I've, if I've got this uh, special bottle, not so easy. The last thing we would take, and this would just be if you were, you know, had them is like vests or robes for the corner people to wear just to show that we're from the same club. Usually the fighter will wear one out or a t shirt. And if you've uh, got mates to get you a weird blingy jacket for the corner, mm -hmm. make sure you've got your gay bikey. <laughs> so, the good thing about this one for me is it uh, it has big pockets at the front, so I can put vas in one and the mouth guard goes in the other one, and uh, that allows me to control it. Um, you'll see a lot of people That's with <laughs> you'll see a lot of people with um, uh, bum bags. Uh, That's just small, so they can keep the cut kit into it. Sorry, if it was a uh, the next part of my kit. This is for amateurs as well as pros, but not for into and stuff. So liniment oil and Vaseline. Now, you're best off getting the fighter to supply the Vaseline because you should not cross-contaminate Vaseline from one fighter to another. Once you've used it and wiped it on one person, then that's contaminated with them, particularly if they're bleeding and you're patching them cut then their blood's going to be in there too. So you generally only want to use it for one person. So a small container is much better than the big containers too. So don't this fit in a pocket. The big ones is like lugging it around everywhere. And you don't need much face, you know, unless you're packing a cut. Um, baby oil we usually only use for crow fights and we just mix some bass and that to make them a bit oilier. So you'll see in like one FC now, they wipe all the oil off the fibers before they even get in the cage or the ring. Um, but uh, in Thai fights, you're normally allowed to have it. They expect a little bit on you. If it looks too oily or bassy, the ref will grab a towel and wipe, wipe you down. 
Uh, so you've got to sort of get that bright level. Usually if you've oiled and fast up 10 minutes before, like the second time, so we do one oil up, soaks in, like uh, 40 minutes, half an hour, an hour before, then we do another quick one just before we go out, just to put that little bit of sheen, just so it's hard to grip on the person. These are uh, like uh, makeup swipes. These are very good for uh, cut control, so uh, putting pressure on and holding uh, cuts. Very rare you, you'll use them, but um, they're very useful for that. This is my cut kit and swell kit. I have a um, specimen jar, which I would break an amulet of um, adrenaline, thanks man, an amulet of, of adrenaline in. Uh, Anthony. 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 One of these things. I will, I will uh, put that in here. It's like a few drops. Then I will put some bass over the top of it just so it sits there because this stuff, once it's out, it starts to degenerate within 15 minutes. It's still useful um, for longer, but it's used stuff to go down. So you only do it just before your fight is getting ready to be called out. Put the vats over and hopefully that sort of creates a bit of an air pocket and then if there's a cut, I just wipe the vats into it and then that's what I'm going to pack with. Or what I try and do is I would have the, the vats sort of over it a little bit, I'd lift it, put like three of these in because you need like a bit of a surface depending on the cut. Dip them in, hold it on and then apply pressure across the whole area and then mix the vas and I would be applying the, once I've held this down for like 45 seconds of the time that I've got then I would take it off and then I would start applying the vas in with the adrenaline in it as well to try and help pull the blood away from the surface and shut the capillaries down and hopefully stop the person. Is that a co co No, it just closes the capillaries down, it doesn't coagulate the blood. Yeah. That's the point of being put the adrenaline in there. Yeah. Um, but you look at it, for, for most parts, for a three rounder, it's probably not going to matter. Like, if the cut's that bad, the ref's going to stop it. So, you, you normally, if you vas it, that'll, that'll be enough. You know? um, if it's a five rounder, then you're yeah, possibly getting cut in the early rounds, and then you've got to fight through the whole round. So, it mainly gets used for boxing, which is 12 rounds. So, if they get cut early, you've got a lot of rounds and getting tagged in the same spot. So, uh, more for that. Uh, this is called an easy swell, or a um, Swell iron, and it's used to just apply pressure to swelling. You can use it to try and push the blood away, but it can cause some damage, so we don't tend to do that so much. You just use it like a cold press, and you can use it across the cut and stuff to apply pressure. So this would be sitting in my ice, and we put a thin coat of Vaseline over it so that when we hold it on, it doesn't stick to the skin. So if I went straight from ice to their skin, there's a chance that as I pull it, I'll tear their skin. So always Vaseline on that line. There's been a couple of fights where we haven't been able to find this and it's been a, a fair fight, so I've taken a couple of teaspoons or, or um, dessert spoons, but exactly the same. So, you know, just this is thicker, so it holds the coldness longer, but something like that can work in, if you haven't got anything. Just use that. Okay, can you sit there on your ice? Yes, so it stays in the bucket the whole time. And the corner, if we're in a fight, I'll say, Bucky's got a cut, then they'll know to get this out ready for me. I'll get my uh, cut equipment out and ready, and then jump in, they pass that, and we can start working. Do you last before you put in the ice? Or? Yes. So it's been in the ice the whole time we warm up. So we get there an hour before we try and get the ice and everything ready. That would be sitting there for an hour, then just before we go out, we pass it and drop it in. It's still staying cold. No. Most promoters supply ice, the low level fights, amateurs, they won't. Yeah. So you either grab a bag of ice or, to be truthful, like, it's not when we need it. Because it's only a uh, minute and a half rounds, like three, and usually okay, not to be overly cool. Get the water down the back of the neck's usually enough. Pull my own injuries, where do you get those ice from? Just uh, like Chemist Warehouse, okay. you know, those sort of places, yeah. or online. And there's different quality ones too. So. These ones are an old style, oh, they, and the inside's like a plastic, and they break, so there's no, they don't hold the water, it comes out really quick. So the ice stays in, the water comes out 
we like a slurry, so these aren't very good. These ones are very small, and they're okay, they don't cover a big area. We've got some orange ones that have like a really good rubberized inside, a very big bag, so we can decide how far to fill it. And they're good for uh, not only in the fight, but if someone needs to tape afterwards, they cover a large portion, uh, particularly shins that need to be taped and straight. Cool. All right, and two more things. Uh, towel, we need a small towel and a large towel. The large towel gets used for when we uh, are getting the fighter ready, so we have it on the ground, they lie on it, we massage them. Uh, we also need this large towel for ring spills. So in Thai we're generally very messy, this is good for the uh, seconds to take out, and every time they climb out of the ring, they go in the corner and do this, and wipe up as much as they can. Part of the reason we want to do this, so that our fighter doesn't slip over, we also don't want any stalling in the fight. If our fighter's winning, we want the ground to start as soon as possible. If um, your fighter was having a hard time, you might make a real mess in the ring and then the ref will stop it and tell you to clean up. It might give your fighter another 10 or 15 seconds. So you can you know, utilise stuff if your head's clear enough to do that. Usually so. Anyway, small towel is for the uh, coach. We generally go in so they can wipe off any blood or anything like that. You generally don't want to be standing there fanning. It doesn't make much difference and you can blow dust in their eyes and stuff like that. You can do it, but usually water will cool them quicker and the ice bags than just blowing a bit of air. You'll see boxing do it more because they generally don't have the ice bags uh, as much, uh, although most of them do now. So it's more of an old school thing for the towel weight. The other reason is I may need to stop the fight and I have to throw the towel over the ropes for the referee to see, uh, and that's why I need to make sure I have a towel. There's been a couple of times I must admit very uh, poorly I haven't taken a towel and had to take off a t-shirt or something because I thought I'm going to have to stop the fight and I haven't got something in my hand to throw. Like at an amateur event or something where I haven't had the full kit. So make sure your kit's ready to go so you don't have weird shit like that happen. You suddenly think, where's the towel? I haven't got one. Oh my god. Alright. In the back room, fight preparation, setting up. So we get into the back room. It will usually be either a very small pokey space or like a massive basketball stadium. Really, something in between. So you want to generally get there. Uh, you, you generally got to be there at a certain time anyway. But if you can be there a bit early to claim the spot and leave your stuff and then go, then that's a good idea. So you, you want to get um, an area where it's big enough that you can lay someone down, if possible. Uh, you also want a couple of chairs. Now that doesn't. You don't need those until you're wrapping hands, but you'll need two chairs if possible for yourself. Um, and then as far as the other setup stuff, you would hang the Mong Kong on the wall normally. So the idea with the Mong Kong, like I said, this is an old one that we don't use, so that's why I'm sort of playing with it. But with the Mong Kong, we normally start to touch the ground. You try and keep it above your heart height at all times. Not always possible, often in bags and stuff like that. But when you get there, you, you would generally hang it. The way we normally hang it is you can have a um, coat hanger would be great, and then find something to hang that on. Or take the coat hanger to the wall. But if you're like us, or well, you don't generally have coat hangers. So, we just get a bit of tape, and we stick it on the wall, and then we put the Mong Kong through, and then we roll the tape back so the Mong Kong's not touching the sticky bit of the tape. And then we just put another bit of tape across that bit, just to hold it there, and then that would hold it until we need it. Just pull it off, and then you hope you don't destroy whatever's falling. Usually this tape's not too bad, but it doesn't need to go off too much. Okay, so, um, we've got the towel, 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 we've got the so uh, we normally try and get the seconds to do it a bit just so that they're involved as well. And it, it's funny that the massage takes maybe 15 minutes, 10 minutes, depending on the person. Um, but it's tiring. But the stuff's hot, the, the liniment. Thanks, you know. Just break it towards. <laughs> so, um, it, it's, uh, it's hot work, but it's a good way to relax a fighter and, and do them. So you want, you want to know what you're doing a little bit when you're doing it. So if you go too deep on your massage, 
you're going to fatigue the muscle, um, possibly uh, you know, break some capillaries, you know, there's a chance you, you're going to be uh, inflaming an injury that they may be keeping under control. So you want to know the fighter, what you're doing. Some people don't like any oil on their chest because they feel like they can't breathe after it. Some people like the oil everywhere. So you just got to at least done a massage with them prior to the fight so that they know what it feels like and then they train with the oil on so they can experience what it's like. Um, and then, yeah, you do it. So uh, I'll go through a massage now, David. I'll just quickly say, before you massage, you put Vaseline under armpits, Vaseline uh, sort of in the lower belly just before it goes into the shorts and um, on the neck around here, on the front. And then when you massage, because it burns under the armpits, and it can burn if it goes down into your shorts. So that just sort of helps create a little bit of a barrier. When you're doing it, generally, when you're massaging the front, you get the person to put a towel in their face because they can splash up and go in your eye and then something else to deal with. When you do their back, you normally just put Vaseline across the back part of the neck here. Um, and again, just down in the lower part near the, the shorts and um, yeah, in the back of the knees. And that's pretty much it, then, then it's the oiling on. Um, warm up, warm up would depend on the fighter. Uh, so we might warm up um, normally like uh, say the bite and a half before the fight that's on. So the, the reason for that is um, if the fight, if we start warming up on the fight just before ours and it's a knockout, then we might not have enough time to fully warm up. So if the guy's been you know, sitting around, we've done the massage, it's still like 30, 40 minutes to go, then they're still probably going to be moving around a little bit, you know, sit down for a little while, get up, move around a little bit, get a show of work, sit down, then we'll say, okay, we're going to do a proper warm up now, and then that'll be like five minutes of properly like working on the techniques we want to work on, okay, that jab's been fine enough, good man, let's practice that jab a bit, you know, step off, you know, so even if someone who doesn't do a lot of pad work, then we'll still work it. So even with Tum, for instance, he'll just do a lot of show, but I'll be work, walking with him. So while he's doing the show, I'll show him, man, looking good, looking good, oh, great, great thing. You know, like just that encouragement, I'm already he's getting used to my voice, I'm in his ear, I'm building him up, even in the show stuff. So we start to build that feeling up, and he starts to feel like, yeah, I'm in the fight, sort of thing, you know, even though it's relaxed. We'll often have a few laughs. It's not like we're generally trying to make it like serious, serious, you know, it's serious, but there's still that element of fun in there. And, and a bit of mood, so it breaks the, the stuff a bit. Otherwise, it's, it was so serious, the um, emotional tiring is too intense. Fighting is not. Um, gloves, etc. Someone's got to decide who's going to go and get the gloves uh, because you have to go and collect those and shin guards and whatever else, depending on the fight. You've also got to decide who's going to put the gloves on and who's going to take the gloves on. So you want all that decided pre fight because there's a pro it takes time, it's a process to it. Uh, who's going to watch the car? So normally one of the seconds would say, um, you know, so Dylan's there. Dylan, can you watch the car? Just make sure where they're up to. So Dylan knows to come and tell me five fights before, three fights before, two fights before, one fight before, ready to go. Because yep. the car can change as well. You know, two people might get pulled out before they even fight, but it's halfway through the car before you find out. The car gets juggled. So they've got to be sort of keeping their eye on it and asking. It's car change. Is anything, anything change on the car? I've been on a fight. The car was written backwards, and uh, it really like it was just so messed up. So we thought we were like eighth, but we were third fight or something. You know, it was a mess. So always ask. Um, official checks. So someone's got to go and say. Uh, usually um, to the officials. Oh, we're, we're ready now. We're, we've we've taped up. We're wrapped. Can you come and mark the hands off? Or the doctor. Well, we haven't seen the doctor yet. The doctor's got to come out and see our guy. So normally they'll come out to a change room and try and do the whole change room, but you won't have wrapped everyone at the same time, or some people won't be there yet, or whatever. So they'll normally try and follow it up too, but if you go out there and it hasn't been done yet, then it's not going to flop, so you've got to be onto it. And who's going to put on the Hong Kongs and Pro Sheets? So if uh, you're putting them on, um, you want to know how to do it, and who's going to put it on. You want to plan your walk in a little bit. So we've got there, we know that we're in red corner. Dylan will come back out to me and he'll say, Mac, uh, red corner's right around, so we're going to have to walk through the main doors, then we're going to go to our right hand side, go all the way around, the steps are around there, we'll come up. Or he might say, we're in red corner, but they've got central steps, so we're going to come out, we're going to walk straight down the aisle, central steps there, 
and uh, we'll go around to the red corner and uh, whatever. So we know what the layout is, the fighter knows what it is, so then we can walk out with that pre range. The ropes, which second is going to go up and help with the ropes? So <laughs> when we walk up, as, as the trader, normally I'd get the fighter to go first, I'd walk behind them, seconds would come next. Uh, we get to the, the corner, I would now walk up after the fighter, so the fighter would do their thing, it'd go up, I'd walk up and go to one side, the next second would come up and go to the other side, the third second, the third, we'd go around with the bucket and everything and start setting up the corner. But we might only have two people, so the bucket and everything just gets put on the ground, the other second comes up, the uh, fighter does their ways, then we hold the rope down, they climb over, second goes down, gets the bucket, all the equipment goes all the way around, and I just walk through the ring with the fighter and go to the corner. So the coach can walk across, seconds have to go around. Um, so that, yeah, so you've got to pre plan that workout, uh, the walkout. The pre fight corner, uh, sorry, rope set up corner. So setting up the corner means that he needs to know where the stool is, where the bucket's going to go. Hang stuff on the rope thing, so the towel's there ready to go on the thing. The bottle of water's open and ready to go, either in the bucket or sitting next to the turnstile. Um, he needs to have worked out that uh, Matt can jump up quickly from this side, but there's all officials on this side, so we can't squeeze in that end there. The stool's over here, that's gonna be hard to lift from that angle, so we're gonna put the stool over here so we can get in under one swing. So it's gotta sort of be planned. Someone's there stairs in the corner, really. Sometimes it's good. But normally, you've got to either just jump straight into the ring, just climb straight up, or you've got to run around to the side to climb in, depending on the age of the people in the corner. But you want that process sort of worked out. So as you set up the corner, in your head, you want, you're planning that out. Because the coach, you're still standing up talking to the, fight, you don't, the fighter. You don't want to be distracted with what's happening down here. And as soon as I stand down there, I want to be able to look and go, okay, that's how I want it. They, they, they've done an awesome job. Played out exactly how I need it. You know? Don't want to be fighting it. And it, but it will happen. Easy. So I'm up on the corner post, the, the fighter's here, I'll climb back out through the rope, stand there and talk to them. Because I'm, again, I'm trying to make them think that everything's normal, everything's calm, this is what happens every time we're at the fights. So they'll climb in, they'll walk around, if it's their first fight, they'll be nervous and just standing there like this. <laughs> if they've been fighting for a while, they'll lie on the ropes, they'll turn and talk to you and go, oh man, I can't wait for a steak after you know, whatever else. Then the other fighter will come in, or you'll come in second, whichever. Then the referee will ask the fighters generally uh, to, oh, sorry, the referee will come over and check you've got a groin cup on for, for guys, and that you've got a mouth guard. And if the fighter hasn't got the mouth guard in, normally I'll just show the mouth guard and they'll go, okay. And they'll go, they'll go and check the other guy. Then we'll seal the ring. So uh, music will start, they'll go around and do the ring seal. If it's full fight, then they'll do the way through. We'll normally either I'll just squat down in the corner or I'll go down and stand down with the others, wait for that to finish and then jump back up. Then they come back after the, the ceiling of the ring all the way through, I'll give them water, and then the referee will call them in, give them last instructions. And it'll normally be guys don't hit each other in the balls, we've talked about this, you know, rah, rah, rah. go back to your corners, put mouth guard in, um, that sort of stuff done. So, uh, the order of that would normally go, Phil, can you just jump up a sec? Would the official have done a brief already in the chambers? Yeah, not, not too much for low levels. Yeah, yeah. High levels a little bit. Yeah. yeah. It's usually pretty plain. Yeah. Normally, you know what rules you're fighting? Yeah. Full tie? That's yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. K1, so remember you can't sweep. You know. um, so, Phil's, uh, uh, we've got into the ring, blah, blah, blah. The, the rest come over and tap them on the balls, whatever the announcement's made. From Smack Jim, whoa! I do just turn around for a sec, just gonna take the robe off. Cool, thanks man. All right, we're gonna seal the ring in a sec, stay calm. Let's do it, brother. Then he'll go and do the seal of the ring. Then he'll come back, get some water, put it, put your mouth, go, good, take my on. Then the, the ref will call him in and have his last chat. Then they're ready to fight, step back, in. So normally you try and take the Hong Kong off because after the rest talk to them, he normally just wants them to go back and then it, it's like fight on. Yeah. So that would normally be the, the process time. Thanks, Phil. So as a shirt and robe, I'd take off, give to the corner, to the seconds, they would hang on the thing or put it in the bucket. So it's their responsibility to look after everything that's getting 
taken off the football. Um, Vaseline, generally out the back, we'll have already put Vaseline on the person. At this point, we may just free Vas quickly. Um, depending on the person's skin, depending on the fight, how long the fight is, if they've got a helmet on, won't vest much. With a helmet, we'll normally actually vest the top of the helmet, the cheek of the helmet, just so the glove will slide a little bit more. Um, but if it's an uh, amateur fight, often they won't let you use any gas at all, so if you don't put it on when you're out there, you put it on earlier. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. Quarter man coach. Go to the fighter, settle them straight away, stay calm, make sure the seat is in position before getting them into the corner and seating them. So, we're in the fight now. Fight started. Uh, they've come back, first round, come back. So, I climb in. I know it's 10 seconds because I've heard the or whatever noise has been made, so I start getting ready to, to get in. Depending on the fighter, it depends on what I'm going to prepare. So, sometimes I'll have absolutely nothing because I've got to go, I'm going to go straight out to them. Other times I'll jump in with a water bottle because the really relaxed and then it's going to come stand in the corner. So it depends on the corner crew as well. So I'm, I'm going to say like it's a high level one, high level person. So I don't, I don't to take it. I jump in, go and meet them sort of halfway. If it's like time is light, I might give him a stretch. If it's not, I would just go out, walk in the man, just, you know, doing good, we're doing good. You know, getting back. From this point, I already want to be smiling at them. You know, and the corner when they come in, they're stressed because they're going like, I don't know what to do. But they need to be smiling a bit too. As soon as they sit down, they want to be able to say something like, oh God, awesome, you know, or really good job, really good job. And then they shut up. You know, so only one person can talk in the corner while the corner's happening. So they're going to be quiet. So I, I remove the person's mouth guard. Some folks prefer to leave it in. So if they want to leave it in, don't sleep in. If not, I'll quickly pull it out, put it in my pocket so it's ready to go again. If I haven't got a pocket, you may hand it to a second. Got to get that back in. I've forgotten in the past. Not good. So, what's still on? So, uh, make sure you, you know, you've got it ready to go. Uh, make sure they're breathing as normal as possible. So, the first thing you want to do is control them and get their breathing back. Before you start giving them any real info or whatever, you, whether they're sitting in the corner or standing, just like breathe. Good. Now, some people will get it really quick so you don't have to go. But other people, you've got to stand there, hold their shorts, go. Push your stomach out into my hand, breathe deep, deep, deep. Come on, breathe out. Breathe with them. Good, nice, calm. Right, so once you've got them into a, a good breathing, and that will normally take five to 10 seconds, depending on the person. So it's not forever, but give it that time. Don't, don't over rush. Uh, take a water bottle for a second, give them a small sip. Like I said, hydration isn't a big issue. Dry mouth this. Um, fix any cut, direct pressure, ice, Vaseline. Generally, you won't have any cuts, so there's nothing generally there to fix. Wipe off any blood. So often they'll have blood from the nose, blood from their opponent. So often their opponent will be bleeding, blood goes on each other's gloves, ends up on each other's chest. You want to wipe it off so that the judges can see that your uh, guy is clean. And then that it's in their head, it's like, man, he's dominating this fight. When they both look messy, it's like they're both the same. You know, So it's just another clear cue to the judges that my guy's clean. This isn't his blood, you know, this is the other guys. So it's that sort of um, thing you're trying to do. Also, the blood rules and that sort of stuff. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we've done that. Um, we're now going to give them instructions and feedback. So we dictate, we don't have a conversation with them. So it's not like, um, uh, how do you reckon you're going? Like, you know, what's going on there? So you might ask something, you might say, like, um, so let's say I noticed that. Uh, Guy wasn't stepping in as much as he should, and I say, Well, how was his power? No, no, his power's alright. Alright, so in my head now, when I finish, it's going to be, You know, he's not strong enough to hurt you. Like, you've got to drive him in. So I'll keep that in my back of my head for that. But that might be a conversation because I want him to have said he's not powerful. So he knows in his head he's not, you know, like, um, so I'm, I'm going to read it. But generally, you just want to dictate to the person. Dictate the next round, don't go into the last round so much. So don't spend time saying we did this, we did that in the last round, or you could have done this, or you should have done that. All you want to talk about really is what's about to come up. Alright, in this next round I'm going to really need you to keep moving off to your left side, you know. Just make sure you get out there. I notice in that one that every time you step to the to the right, blah blah blah, let's really work to that left side. You know, so you, you sort of just more or less talking about what happened, what what you want to happen in this next round, you can refer back to what you saw in the last round, but not so much what 
took place in the last round. So we don't want to dwell on, on it, particularly if it wasn't a great round. If it was a really good round and the guy came back, and this is the best thing that you can ever have with your fighter and say to your fighter, he's like, man, just keep doing the same thing. This, this is all you. Like, there's nothing for me to adjust or change here. You just keep doing what you're doing. You know, and, and that, and it happens, you know, that's not like a, a fake thing that can happen sometimes, it's just their night. So that's the, the best when the corners like that. When they're not going so well, that you've got to be trying to think, how do I motivate them and put them on track to get going again? You need to be articulate and super clear in your instructions. Explanations can fit into three categories. Overall strategies, so that uh, is like lifting the work rate, punches in bunches, cut the ring, follow up, that sort of stuff. So in this round, I need you to really lift the work rate. You need to score more. Just punch, 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 you know? Something like that. Uh, specific techniques or tactics. So I might have noticed that you know this guy that I'm training is pretty good, he can pick things up. So I noticed that every time the guy, uh, for example, worked that left kick or knee to the split. So I noticed him that the guy keeps, uh, oh sorry, keeps throwing up high but there's nothing in or his elbows are out here. So I'll say to my guy, just keep aiming for his split. Use that left leg, left knee, left body rip, everything. Just keep hitting that body because he's not going to like it and it's open all day. You know, so that might be my technical instruction to them. And then the last thing is the mindset, so to motivate. So if you keep doing what you're doing, you know, you're winning this, or the person you know, needs to really push this next round. So throw everything into the next two minutes. It's going be stuff, you know? And it, and it can be like borderline. Like you don't know, fight is like one run round, lost one round, you know, this is the third round. It's like, throw everything into this. This is, this is it, you know? You throw everything into this, we've got this. You know, but don't, don't stand back. Everything into this round. Um, if, let's say that one where we talked about, I said how was the power, because I noticed he was not going in. It might be something like, uh, he can't stop you, he doesn't have the power to stop you. You've felt everything he's got, and it, didn't, it hasn't worked and it's not going to work, but you've got the power to stop him. So you've got to go out there and stop him now, because you're not going to win on points anymore. So let's say we lost the first two rounds, because the guy just stood back. That guy just didn't engage, you know, just stood there. But nothing, there's nothing wrong with him, you know? He just hasn't engaged. So we can say to him, like, you've taken the best he's got, you're still there. But you can go out and stop him, so just get in there and go hard, you know, like, this is your round. Um, or if you know what their why is, so we talk about why we set up a fight, why are they doing this, why are they giving up all their time, why are they going to fight, why are they risking all this? And often they'll keep that to themselves and sometimes they'll share it. If they share it, then we can put it back to them now. Don't forget why you're doing this. This was because you wanted to prove, blah, blah, blah. this is because, you know, whatever. Or you might even just say, man, you know why you're fighting. Get out there and show us everything you've got. Prove this to yourself. You know, so that might be the thing that motivates us. You know, find what's what's your fighter that, that's that thing that's going to pull that last heartstring to get them to really go hard. Um, if there's a knockdown or you think your fighter is hurt, you have to wait. Don't jump in. Don't feel like the mum's got to wrap them up. You've got to wait because the count will start. And they might get up, they might be fine. They might just think that they've slipped and hurt their knee or whatever else. You know, uh, same if it's a knockdown and you jump in, the fight's over. So that's the same as you saying, no more. And your guy might, your girl might be fine. You know, so don't over rush. Wait for them to deal with it, then come in once it's been decided. Waved off, then you go up. If the doctor's treating your fighter, you're not actually allowed to touch them or, or, or overcrowd them or do anything. They pretend to or anything. So try and stay back. Um, who can decide the end of the fight? Anyone? Are you allowed to be present? Sorry, just to take what you said there, the doctors. Uh, yeah, you can stand off the side. They don't want to go overcrowding, they want yeah. space in case they need to get the uh, mini bed in or something. But you, I like to be close because they might have uh, questions. Does his shoulder normally look like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, to do the dodgy shoulder. I don't think it's this kind of uh, Whatever it is. What about even if that was in a fight for like a cut, for example, to come up and check a cut, would you be able to No, they, they will normally go to the center of a flat. They normally won't uh, have you. So it depends on the fight. So they may, some doctors don't seem to have much equipment, so they'll come to your corner and get up and go, can you stop that? And you'll, you know, if it's an amateur fight and it's blood nose, someone's up come to the corner and say, can you, can you try and stop that in 10 seconds? And you'll hold the towel on their face. And, and they say, okay, all right, go back in and fight. So it depends on the thing. At a high level fight, no, you, the doctor has to be um, separate to you. You're not really meant to interfere with their decision making. And they will talk to the ref, you're not even meant to really listen. You know, nothing can't 
they'll discuss it. Because they might say, um, I'm, I'm happy to let it go, but if he you know, gets hit two more times, that's fine. And it's over. You know? So the fighter can do it. For the moment, the ones here with the doctor maybe they're just for their lives and say, how do they have to somebody there to go, okay, it's okay, keep going, or no? Yeah. Is that, is that more what it is? Like, so, the. It's a, it's a legal thing, but it, it's it's a real safety thing. So let's say you're my corner and we're uh, related and you know how much this fight means to me, but I've been knocked down three times and I've, and you know how much this fight means to me, so you're going to let it keep going because you're hoping that I've got that last punch you need to do. And it's dangerous, you know? Yeah. So the, 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 the doctor's there to go, no, yeah. he's, he's had enough, you know, he can't find it. Um, so the people that can stop the fight are the uh, centre ref, the doctor, and the corner. The three people that can stop the fight. So the corner has to throw the towel, or they might try and wave it off, but the towel is the clear signal, where everyone stands. The doctor will, will get up or ask them to ding the bell to stop it, and the referee will obviously step in to stop it and wave it off. So this is just, you know, this is the fight's over. Uh, exiting the ring after a fight. So uh, there's no big thing, normally you just help lift the ropes, let the fighter get out, and we'll get out as quickly as you can after you've had a photo or whatever you do. Make sure you get all the gear and take that out. Afterwards, you've got to pack up all your gear because it might get stolen, and you want to monitor your fighter because they may have got through the fight perfectly well and then collapse 10 minutes later. Unlikely, but possible. So you want to make sure that someone's with them. So if me as a coach, I've said, man, I've got to go home, or I've got another three fighters on, then I'll say the seconds, one seconds, you know, make sure we're checking on such and such every now and then, or one of their family members, you know, hey, it's, um, they've just had the fight, they've done really well, but just seriously, or just need to keep an eye on them, don't let them leave for another, you know, half an hour or so, so if something happens, the doctor's here, you know, so you just have that quick chat. So we want to. Seconds. The second sets up the corner. Have the stool in an easy to get out spot so you can pass up the rope easily in one swing. Bucket needs to be available at all times. If the fighter is cut or their mouth guard comes out, a referee may ask you to deal with it. You need to be able to pass the coach what he needs before he asks for it. So if they see their mouth guard come out saying to my does, I expect them to hold me a water bottle straight up so I can rinse it, put it in, and go. So we work as a team. They're trying to work out what I'm going to need before I, I even ask for it. Um, have the large towel ready to wipe before each time after getting out of the ring. If you notice anything during the fight, such as a cut or a tactic, let the coach know. So when the fight's on, I don't mind the corner calling things out and, and creating a bit of noise. If the fight's on the edge, I might say to them, uh, quiet for a bit, I, I, I want it to be clear. Um, and also if they're seeing stuff in the corner, they might say, man, he's just not moving to the left, or he's not using his cross punch, or he's not using this or that. Shit, he's not, you know, because I, I'm not going to see everything either. There was one fight we had a guy, and everything was just missing below like 10 centimeters. He made another, what's going on, you know? And then one of the, the seconds go, it's like he just doesn't think to step in 10 centimeters. And I went, yeah, it's like he's not thinking to step in 10 centimeters. So when he cut a corner, I said, you just got to step in another 10 centimeters. Next round, he went out, bum, bum, bum. And it happened, you know? So it was as simple as that. And they gave me a, a clue of what to say that I was able to deliver and it worked. So that was great. Um, when the coach is in the corner, you keep your mouth closed, only one person gives instructions. It is your job to assist the coach and reinvigorate, reinvigorate the fighter. Do this by using ice bags, massage, cold water on the body, vigorous rubbing, or smiling as they come back to the corner and as they leave the corner. So the invigoration, so it could be as full on as being with ice bags, really rubbing hard in his body to get his blood flowing. It could be as much as having a nice bag on his head and me just rubbing the back of his neck as a second. It could be that, you know, because the seconds are outside through the ropes, so they might be just like, you know, while I'm talking, like, pat on the mat. You know, like, you know, like they're just that encouragement of, yeah, you're doing well, because they're not going to say much, you know. And then before they get out, so 10 seconds, or they say seconds out, so I'm trying to jump out. They've got more time because I've got to climb out. So at that point, they'd go something like, this is awesome, we're doing well, or they tap the person's leg because they want to be standing up waiting, and they just have to get out there, you know, like smash it. So that's their final bit of reinvigoration and motivation. Like the team's behind you, we believe in you, this is going to be awesome. If they're too uh, concentrating and too dull, then the fighters might just get that 
Asu Bira Ki. In order to sing that Asu Bira Ki, Asu Bira Belief. At the end of the fight, uh, collect the bucket, towels, bottles, old tape, Hong Kongs and robes. You want to have that sort of list in your head as a second because you will forget stuff because it's hanging everywhere and you've got to get out quickly and your fighter might have just won, you're excited, the fighter's knocked out, you're really concerned. You know, so the second needs to just not worry about all that. They've got to deal with getting all the stuff and you'll see them in the change room. That's it. Any questions? <laughs> cool. Do you like to, just as, just as a preference, do you like to have one second, two seconds more the merrier? Or uh, two seconds is perfect for me in the corner. Um, but look, if, if it's a. I, I, I get a lot easier on my own. I have no trouble cornering someone on my own. Uh, where it would be a problem is if there's a cut, yeah. and then you try and do those two jobs. But having a team there, it's just it's much more supportive for you and, it's, and they're also there to make sure you don't forget. See, a fight's the weirdest thing. Out the back, the time spaces out for so long. Hours just doing nothing. And it doesn't matter how prepared you are, the last 30 minutes is nuts before you go out there. It's a panic. You know, like, I've got to get this done. Oh, shit. You know, and all the stuff's happening. And then the fight happens and then it's all a blur and then it's, it's over. It's the weirdest stretchings and compressions and expansion of the time you've ever experienced. So the team helps with that a little bit. Um, and generally, for my seconds, I like to have someone that's uh, super serious and takes the role really seriously. And someone else who uh, really enjoys doing the job, but is a little bit lighthearted so they can break the moods up in the, in the chamber. And some fighters would like to just isolate, and then it's even boring for a corner. What you like? Fuck So you go and watch the fights and stuff. But it's it's good having you, you sort of you're there as buddies, you know. Like, yeah, it's much better. Yeah. And all the yeah, amateur standpoint, would you like? You know, sometimes you get getting dressed in the sweater ringies and stuff yeah. like that. Do you like the fighters watching the fights? Do you, do you like the fighters watching the fights? Totally up to the, the fighters. So yeah. on an amateur day. We, my, my thought personally, Bill's been actually working the amateurs more than me lately. But my thing is that it's like a carnival, like a fight carnival, you know? Come, watch the fights, have a fight, watch the fights, enjoy the day. You know, it's, it's this thing, it's not, you're not fighting for a title, you're not, so we take it seriously, but let's not feel like it's all, like, this so, so serious that you can't. Enjoy the day as well. So yeah, I, I don't mind. It could be worse. At, I don't know. It goes two ways. You could be at the back, and your corner keeps losing. <laughs> you know, blue corner keep coming back. Oh, you're like, don't look at them. You know, I'll cut, I'll cut you. <laughs> and, but if they saw it, they'd realise that that guy was uncle or shit. You know, no wonder he got beat up. You know? yeah. <laughs> you're not like that. You're, yeah. you're okay. So Dill uh, normally doesn't watch many. Yeah, I'm really boring. <laughs> and other guys will, will sit and watch heaps so or we'll stand out where your corner is and just look through and just feel the vibe of the players and the fights. And once you've been fighting for a while, then you start to know for other fighters, so you go, oh, I'll watch them before my fight or after it. So I haven't got a hard and fast rule that, Craig. I, I just leave it really leave up to the fight. Yeah, because I remember once we were good. Yeah. The fights the climbs next. He's out there watching it, and the guy got absolutely murked. He yeah. was out kind of standing up, and he just went, "Oh fuck!" And it was just this like just a re dose of reality, and yeah. it just rapid into his core. See, so and and that can happen for sure. But same if we're sitting in the corner, like we we could be warming up, and someone's getting fifteen stitches here. <laughs> you know, like, you know, you stretch a bit, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so it's the same. You're like. A lot of times mm -hmm. a, a choice of watching the fight before it was anyways, most of the time you have to sit there, like they take you to another room or they take you to an area where you have to just like wait for the next fight to finish and you just kind of forced to watch it most yeah. of the time, even if you don't Yeah, yeah most places you, you have to be out ready for that whole fight before, uh, depending on the level of the fight, so, so that as soon as it stops they can get you up. Alright, we're done.
Thanks very much, George.